I have the honor to introduce our keynote speaker in the person of Dr. Lenora Falani. Lenora B. Falani, PhD, is the co-founder of the All Stars Project Incorporated. She is also the founder and director of Operation Conversation, Cops and Kids. Dr. Lenora Falani earned her PhD in developmental psychology from the City University of New York. She is the co-founder of the All Stars Project, where she currently serves as a dean of UX and is director of the award-winning program, Operation Conversation, Cops and Kids. A series of dialogues and performance-based workshops with police and inner city youth to help them improve and develop their relationship. She has conducted over 176 workshops involving over 3,700 police officers and inner city youth. Dr. Falani has long been active in creating change through political action. She has twice run for president as an independent. In 1988, she became the first woman and first African American in US history to appear as a presidential candidate on the ballot in all 50 states. That's right, that's right, that's right. She was the first. She was, she was the first. That's right, so the registration. I like to say, I like to say, and I'll say it often and I'll say it a lot more. The reason why Secretary of State Clinton could not say she was the first is because of Dr. Lenora that's Fulani. Right. That's right. Who stands on the shoulders of Shirley Chisholm. That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. Dr. Fulani is currently spearheading the grassroots movement to prevent the New York City Housing Authority from privatizing public housing that has been built to provide decent housing for the poor. <coughs> Before I bring up Dr. Falani, I just want to say my personal testimony, my personal testimony, um, and why I feel so honored to have her in the room and to meet her and to introduce her. I voted for Dr. Falani. The first time I was able to vote in a presidential election, I voted for Dr. Falani. I was a teenager, or maybe young 20s, I don't remember. Um, one of the two. But... <laughs> Not only did I see someone who looked like me and was representing my interests, she spoke about a platform of equality and justice, affordability for more people. The, the student loan crisis that we're facing now was foreseen way back then in 1992. I agree. She spoke about what a lot of us who were inspired by Senator Bernie Sanders what he speaks about and spoke about. She spoke about it way back in 1992. That's right. Yes, did. Yes, did. And I said to Damon, she was Bernie before Bernie. Yes. <laughs> and she inspired me. And I have been in the political process ever since. And to one of the panelists and to Damon's point, a lot of things have not changed. They've gotten worse since 1992. We haven't gained the gains that we thought we would gain by the elected officials that we put in power. They have failed us. The two-party system, to Dr. Falani's, Falani's point way back in 1992, has failed us. In 2018, we're still being failed. So yes, I do caucus with the Democrats. No, I am not all the time happy with the Democrats. Um, I am more of an independent person, but you know, in New York State, you can't be independent and vote because you can't be in the primary. So I just want to say that I am so inspired by having um, Dr. Falani here. And without further ado, Dr. Lenora B. Falani. <laughs> Thank you. I think, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I am so glad to be here. I feel like um, this is an extension of my neighborhood because I've been coming to this part of town for so very long and I have people here who I've known for years. I'm also from Chester, Pennsylvania, so maybe that's um, <laughs> why. Whenever um, I have to speak to an issue that involves destruction of the poor, I turn to Dr. King and his writing. And you see, Dr. King did not only speak to having a dream, he also spoke to the atrocities of the time. Anyway, King spoke to the atrocities of the time that he and we were living in. And his dream before he was gunned down in Memphis in 1968 was not that four decades later, millions of America's poor would still be living and dying in poverty, or that hundreds of thousands of our people would end up being forced out of the housing that they live in and would wind up living on the streets or in shelters in cities all over this country. It's clear to me that if Dr. King were here today, he would be marching in the streets in opposition to all of this. He would be teaching all kinds of people what a horrendous position and perspective this is. And he would be marching against the New York City Housing Authority, NYCHA, and what it is doing to poor people. He would have marched in the streets of Chicago and elsewhere in response to the housing, housing issue. Yeah. To me, this is one of the most important issues in this country for poor people, for our communities, who are being isolated, alienated, and expected to live without any kind of shelter. I came of age in the 1960s. I grew up in a small town, Chester, Pennsylvania. I grew up poor. I was the youngest in my family. And if you grow up black and poor, you see a lot of devastation. You experience a lot of pain. I saw my father dying in bed when I was 12 because the ambulance service refused to come into my neighborhood and pick him up. And my family made a makeshift stretcher, put him in the car, and he died en route. I've lost nieces and nephews. I had 12. Four of them are dead. And then there is the loss of the people who I grew up with. When you go back after graduating from college, and it's not only that you can't find people, but you find out that somehow they were killed or they died. As painful as all of this was, I didn't want to run away from it. I wanted to embrace our people, our communities, and their pain. I became a psychologist. I rejected everything that traditional psychology had to teach about who black people were, who human beings were, and helped to create and develop a new way of looking at and helping people who lived in turmoil and pain and otherwise grow. In New York City, as was mentioned, I'm in a fight for human policy in opposition to a lot of the people in public office who are insisting that their focus is public and public policy. I want to speak about what that looks like by talking about the efforts to destroy the New York City public housing without a plan for those who live there. NYCHA, is privatizing public housing mm, yeah. by transitioning, pu transitioning public housing to so-called affordable housing, owned in part by private developers, developers in New York City, while there is no plan for the likely displacement of 650,000 people who currently live in New York City Housing Authority. They want the land. It's great land. <laughs> it's a lot of space. Their initial plan, and they've done this in five housing projects so far, was to build high rises in the middle of open space and put rich white people there who were who had never lived in the same community as I mean of black people or with black people or any other kind of people. And that that was supposed to go well. They have done some of that building, but people came to realize fairly early 
that that was not going to work. That there was going to be a complete and total madness and that poor people were going to be locked out. I believe that the crisis we're seeing in public housing in New York City are being manipulated by elected officials, led by the mayor, to accelerate the wholesale transfer of public housing to the private sector, which will lead to the displacement of the poor. NYCHA's next gen, as it's called, calls for the privatization of its assets by selling its portfolio and building market rate and so-called affordable housing mm. on low-cost or no-cost leasing of publicly owned land and that the affluent and poor will share the land and live happily ever after. Mm. This is the city's attack on an abandonment of NYCHA's residents, compounded by the fact that privatization will dislocate families, destabilize our young people. Look at what happened in Chicago's transition plan. Where are the people? And look at the suffering. And it will destroy communities. So in the face of NYCHA's incompetence and their corruption, and with NYCHA's recently estimated $25 billion for a capital repair of the housing development, the mayor is seeking to end public housing in New York City. Part of that abandonment has been expressed in the horrible neglect over the years of public housing by the city. It's also expressed in the increased number of evictions leaving people in filthy and unsafe and dysfunctional homeless shelters. People are living in public housing without heat and hot water. Every other day there is a front page article about people freezing <coughs> and their kids freezing in their homes. There is also the lead paint outrage where the chair, Shola Olatoye, lied and then confessed that she lied. What she lied about was that she had signed off on um, uh, the lead paint uh, existence. They looked at the wall supposedly and determined that it was no longer there. And then she got caught because lead paint is all over housing projects. Mm -hmm. And she's still the chair of public housing in New York City. The Department of Investigation has been investigating NYCHA for the past two years. The mayor protects her like she's Queen Elizabeth or something um, and won't take her on because he's complicit with all the deals that are being made and all of the attacks that are being made upon our people. Relative to the NYCHA Next Gen, that's what they call this brilliant plan, to turn over its land to developers for new housing. The mayor has been leveraging pay to play politics beginning when he first campaigned five years ago. His relationship to the Real Estate Board of New York has been in the news over the past two weeks. Reports that campaign contributions came from leading developers who have been getting design bill contracts to fulfill his goals of building 17,000 new units on NYCHA property. I, this so pisses me off, I could barely talk about it. <laughs> it's like, been going on. Um, I'll wait for that. Over the past three to four years, I've been working with tenants and tenant leaders. At some point, the phones in my house started ringing, and people were talking about evictions. They were going into the housing development and saying to people they should move to Buffalo and giving them $5,000. People would go, $5,000 sometimes seems like a lot of money, and they were stuck there, they couldn't find a house, and they couldn't get back to New York City. <laughs> so I organized a committee, it's called the, Independent, the Committee for Independent Community Action. We've collected over 20,000 signatures from public housing residents and other New Yorkers calling on the mayor to stop privatizing public housing. And we're seeing a groundswell of support. We're taking out the message to middle class and wealthy people in our communities, black, Latino, white, we don't care, that this is an issue 
that they have to take some responsibility for, that they have to care about. And people have given signatures, they've taken petitions. The movement, if you will, is growing. The important thing about all of that to me is that it gives people in housing a way to fight. Otherwise, it's very, very scary. You're living in a situation where you don't know when something is going to just go wrong. They made up these rules that if you have a son and he goes to jail, that when he comes back, he can't live in your house. So, I mean, what kind of world is this? Where, where did that law come from? How dare they relate to our people in this way? So many things are amiss. The extreme mismanagement of public housing on the part of the city, our elected officials, our mayor and city council, are partnering with real estate developers to enable the land grab. Then there's a lack of consistent investment in the people of our city who need it the most and a rise in the number of evictions of public housing residents who have no place to go. Sometimes I feel like I'm back in Chester, PA in the 1950s and 60s. One thing that um, I wanted to mention, by the way, is that the, our city council and other elected officials have gotten a lot of money from Redmond. Um, my assistant just gave me the amount and I, of course, just lost it. But people are getting bought off, and they need to be exposed, and they need to be dumped. But even more importantly, the people who are suffering need to be supported. And we need to make sure, as I see people in, to people in New York, that we don't let this happen. We just can't. We can't allow this level of destruction. So, I mean, I could talk for five more hours. Um, I won't. I just want to read a quote that I love dearly. Um, it's called Maladjusted. Today, psychologists have a favorite word, and this word is maladjusted. I tell you today that there are some things in our social system to which I am proud to be maladjusted. I shall never be adjusted to lynch mobs, segregation, economic inequalities, the madness of militarism, and self-defeating physical violence. The salvation of our world lies in the maladjusted. So I invite you to join the maladjusted. I just, let me just, I just saw the, the uh, revenue reports. New York City Council Speaker Corey Johnson raised over 500, what is it, in five thousand. 505,000 for his campaign. He's a new head of um, the city council who came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, large real estate donations have infiltrated both ends of the race for New York City Council Speaker. To some extent, all eight of the candidates who ran for city council speaker have demonstrated some conflicts of interest over the sources of their large donations, um, which people know because it's in the newspaper. And who is getting truly screwed by all of this are the people who live in NYCHA and live in our communities and who are being pushed out. And we are going to fight like hell to make sure that that's not an easy push. They have nowhere to go. And we're going to hold our elected officials accountable one way or the other. And I'm going to expose the hell out of them. Thank you. Thank you.
And one of the most powerful things that I heard in 2005 was um, Al Sharpton was being interviewed by Chuck Todd. And Chuck Todd asked him, who do you endorse? And he said, it's not who we endorse, it's who endorses us. And I think it, um, one of the things that has frustrated me is that as a community, we don't make demands on our politicians before we promise their vote. Like they can, they can continue to keep coming back. And I was just wondering, is anybody getting that message out? That we need to ask who, how are they going to serve us if you want our vote? So, well, if you ask them that question, they're going to say, well. <laughs> they're going to say, and they do say, they're going to be the greatest person, uh, politician elected in the history of the world. The real deal is how do you impact upon the process so that it's easier to get on the ballot. It's very, very difficult as an independent. When I ran for president, we had to get 1.6 million signatures. We're still recovering. <laughs> and I've run for a lot of offices, but it's not just, it's a very challenging, it's a hard thing to do. We should do it. We should figure out how to dump them. But in order to do that, you have to grow the community. A lot of people already demonstrate their disgust with them because they don't come out and keep voting for them. And they often don't have anybody else to vote for. It's, it's challenging because they have a machine. Mm -hmm. If you run as an independent, it's quadrupled anything that you need in order to run. So I agree. I think that we have to build a base that continues to figure out ways to engage them. But what I'm responding to is that it's a real challenge. You have to really build a base in order to be able to accomplish that. So I agree. <laughs> Question? Oh, thank you. Hi, can you talk about the challenges and the struggles of being a woman uh, candidate? Uh, I notice, obviously, with communities of color, the majority of the representation are men. And can you talk about the challenges of being a woman of color, just as a woman running for office, especially on a national level? And how to overcome those challenges? Yes. <laughs> well, we can't become men. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think, well, the issue with running for office oftentimes, for me, I've run a number of times, had more to do with the policies in place and the requirements um, in order to get on a ballot. Um, that's a big deal. And my experience of a lot of the women who have run for office, who run the same ways that men run for office, they end up doing the same kinds of things. I know that sexism uh, exists. I know that there are all kinds of issues. But I think the way to engage them is you have to step out, do what you're doing. When people get in your way, expose it, and keep growing. I'm not intimidated by men. I married one and I got out of it. <laughs> 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 I had a question. I had a statement, and I know her a long, long time. There are some good men in the room. But, uh, yes, we are. 
down. You know how to do more than just pick things up and put them down. Show them that. So look, God, what can we do? And I know I want to know what I can do in my own. But what can we do? Because I have members that are in public housing. It's a big issue. The issue with lead was just dealt with and the impact clergy a meeting that I'm a part of in Harlem. What can we do to join you in this uh, effort and help succeed in making life better for our people? Mm -hmm. public well, one thing that we can do is located in the numbers that are organized in opposition to it. And people who live in the housing project know that it's not just them. Mm -hmm. It's also other people in our community who are stepping out and making a statement about it. One thing that we have done is break through the silence because the mayor and these other folks were looking to do this like under the whatever. Mm -hmm. So nobody would know what's going on. So a lot more people know what's going on. Okay. Um, I think we should do a major march in the city um, of thousands of people. And it's not just the housing um, project people who need to come out, all of us need to come out and make sure, just, you cannot let them get rid of housing that 650,000 people live in. And the people in the housing development that I'm working with are very outspoken, they're very down for this, and they're very frightened. Because it has happened in a lot of places where they've just taken out public housing. And it should never, I mean, 650,000 people is no little thing. But bit by bit, they're, they're vicious. We should go after the mayor. We should go after Shola. We should put pressure on our elected officials who are silent for the most part. They act like this isn't happening. So we can... Just hold it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, also, we can do an event where we invite your elected officials to that event, and everybody that doesn't come to it, we can stop voting for. That's right. And that would make that would make a real statement. You can't do this. You can't I just want to say publicly, I'm ready to co-sponsor that with you. Okay, we're ready. Let's make it happen. All right. Yeah. 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 So now we're talking about educational um, conglomerates mm -hmm. who are basically, um, I guess, making deals that, you know, we'll let a certain number of your students in if we, and they are buying up Harlem by the droves for housing, for all kinds of stuff. So how do we address that as well? Well, I think the, I think, I don't know all of the answers, I know I don't know that. But I think that going after some of the elected officials is an important issue because they are silent. And if you, if we were able to unseat one, the rest of them would have a complete nervous breakdown because they think that they're so there that nothing can touch them. Um, I like Jamon. And he should be, rather than worried about my being in the room, standing up and speaking out in opposition to this. And we can just name them. Um, this is serious. I mean, I, it's, it sounds absurd and ridiculous because that's such a huge number. But these people are serious. I, I got a question. Yes. Uh, well, well, a comment. I can talk loud. Okay. All right. I know you can talk loud. I understand that. You want to fight so it doesn't become uh, prioritized the housing. Is that correct? Did I understand that correctly? Prioritized. Prioritized. That's what I said, right? No problem. Okay, okay, I got it. I got it. I got it. <laughs> the politicians are an issue, but why not deal with those who want to try to take the corporate? Who want to take coming in? Why not deal with them too as well? Let them know that they can't do that. Well, if you deal, first of all, you can't just say to them they can't do it. You have to build the base. That's my point. Out of which you have something backing your words. 
if the political people weren't taking money from revenue, which is the real estate board of New York, and if they would support this, they would be responsible then for organizing the people who put them in office to stand up and fight with them. So you can't just, this is a, That's my point. What is your you, point? You can't think one side of the brain. It's a whole dynamic. So I'm saying you need to go out, those who want to try to come in and take your community, you need to deal with them too as well as the political establishment right, who wants to you, sell your community. You deal with them is that you run them out or you make it impossible for them to do what it is that they're doing. People are dealing with them. They're exposing what they're doing. These people have a million dollars a day in their bank accounts. So you have to organize enough on the ground to go up against all of that. What I'm doing is what we should be doing. We can, I'm, I'm not, I can't go speak to, I, to somebody um, on Wall Street and say don't do this to my people because they won't listen. <laughs> So that's, you have to build. That's what Dr. King did. He didn't go to the racist and say be nice. He built something so that he had a way to fight back. And the political people should be held accountable. They're elected officials. I agree with you 100%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, my, my question is like two parts. Where are you? Oh, okay. <laughs> the two parts is one, we know that they have passed a law that when people get arrested, they cannot get back into the public housing, which I already know is one of trying to get people to move out. But this is the two parts I have. One, what do we do with those that are displaced now coming home? And two, uh, how do you reverse that particular law, knowing that it displaces displaces uh, the youth coming back and it breaks up families because some families can't leave that particular area. So where do, where does the others go and how do we work on that? Well, one thing is that there are like 14 battles embedded in this fight because they're going at, what they're trying to do is Yes, and dislocate everything and everybody. So people are, there are people who are concerned about that and who are working on, um, to some degree, on what you do when they say your kids can come back in. But the other thing that the, um, that NYCHA is good at and that the people who are running this is, is, are good at is every other day they come up with another rule or law. So you can't smoke in public housing. If you get caught smoking, you can get thrown out. People should be able to smoke in their houses, and what they also do then is set people up against people. So I've decided the thing that I want to focus on, which is to organize people on the ground to oppose this. I think at some point we need to figure out how to scare the living daylights out of those people who are elected in those areas, and we need to build a base. Anybody who has other ideas, we would love you to come and help us. This is a huge fight. They've done it. They blew up the housing project in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. If you go to Chicago, people right. live yeah. in slums. It looks like something out of the 1920s, like we're in the midst of a major time of despair. So these people are serious. Everybody should be doing something. And who's not doing this are the people who should be leading it. So we do what we do. The community rises up. So you, I mean, there are about 15 other things that they've come up with relative to creating havoc. And what I'm teaching the community is not to overreact, because that's what they want them to do, and then they throw the families out. <laughs> we have to deal with some of this stuff straightforwardly, and other things we have to figure out how to circumvent. Last question. Hi, Dr. Filoni, thank you. I just wanted to share something with the group. Um, what you're describing is madness, and there needs to be a method to deal with it. Tenacity, perseverance, and never give up. I want to use an example. My council person, Chris Johnson, is here, and I have hounded him. I text him. That's probably he's why he's here. Council. <laughs> I say, ask this question. You got to do it. And now he's my county legislator. <laughs> Even better. It gives me a bigger platform. But when you describe what we have to do, 
it is overwhelming. At 73, I'm saying, I'm done, stick a fork in me. And um, it's really important that the ingredient that you're describing is tenacity and perseverance. And once you have that, you get the energy to keep moving forward. Thank you. I appreciate that. Last question. Last question. I just wanted to make a point to Reverend Norman's point about addressing the real estate developers. I think that, well, we already know the onus is on us, but not so much in community organizations. We need to be involved in the infrastructure. We don't realize that we need to be on zoning boards. We need to be on the planning boards. So that when we get the information about what condo is going up next to you, it's after the fact. It's too late because we're not at the table to be part of the decision-making process. Even going back to voting for your elected officials, we don't realize the necessity to become district leaders and become part of the process as opposed to just agitating from the outside. Well, I have a response to that because the process that I haven't become part of politically is I, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm not going to lock myself into those two parties because it's like bamming your head against the wall. If they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, then we wouldn't have all of these issues. Also, I mean, I think people should join things, all kinds of things. But for me, this housing attack, is a, it's like being in the middle of, I don't know, the early 1900s and beyond, when we realized we weren't totally integrated into the society. It was when Dr. King chose to walk and fight and preach and move us to do something about things in our society that were obscenities and were just outrageous. So this is a new kind of attack in some ways, the, the attack on trying to move everybody who doesn't fit their description out of the cities, because they're not just doing it in New York, blowing up housing projects and then having nowhere for people to go. And making decisions that you have to be some kind of way in order to be a part of what this country is all about. So I think we all need to do something, and I think we should do different things. I'm not critiquing what people are saying, but I'm doing what I'm doing. If people have ideas that work, I would love them, and I would also invite them to come and teach other people how to do it. I think that's important. But this is a big deal. This is devastating to our communities, and we know they don't. Go walk the streets of Chicago. It's like being in hell, and then they describe it as, well, the kids are um, violent. violent, yes, or like crazy or something. But what the kids are, are they are, is that they're poor and they're displaced, and the city is inviting for them. And it's very, very challenging. They're not bad people. They're dealing with craziness. Right. So, yeah, keep it, we can all, yes, <laughs> I'm traumatized, yeah. and I'm not there. We need to stand up and fight, and we should fight in all the different ways that we can, and I hope to shame the city council, but I don't even know if they have any shame, to, these people need to be either moved or forced to do more than what they're doing, and people aren't going to join all these committees, it's not clear where that's going to take us at this point, because I, I mean, I've sat in committee meetings, and it depends on what your relationship is to the people who've been running them for 500 years. Mm -hmm. So we should do everything. If you want to march and fight, you should come and support me, and I will always come up here and support you. And I thought that was the last question. <laughs> okay. All right. But then you asked, right? I just want to make clear that this is a Westchester issue also, because we're not being explicit about that. Thank you. Public Thank housing you. in Westchester has the same problem. No, I was talk about that. Thank you, Dr. Kalani. But I just wanted to make, the, along the same lines, that uh, just to, in terms of the context, that for decades, Westchester County has fought against the construction of affordable or low-income housing in certain communities and has really, under Democrat and Republican administrations, has really had a, a kind of divided 
a, a, a process divided based on race. So only certain communities were building housing to accommodate the poor and uh, people of color for the most part. Um, during the Obama administration, uh, the HUD has forced this county, it battled with this county for eight years in trying to have them integrate housing throughout this county under a Republican county executive. And yet still, uh, <laughs> the most recent ruling on that was the Trump administration guidance that says, you don't have to do it. So obviously in Westchester, there's a, there is a real need for construction of affordable as well as low income housing throughout this county to have access to the poor and for, pe for working class people throughout this county. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. Anyway, thank you all. We got a lot of work to do. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have another panel coming up, so we ask that you guys just have patience. We're going to get our panelists up here, and anyone who didn't get to ask a question, there will be Q&A time, and we are talking about housing.